we we have to have been placed in a game, a game that as a character, the programming allows us to function in. Is the God of this simulation playing me as a Muslim? <laughs> You're looking good, Mike. How are you? It's been a while. I've been traveling so much I haven't seen you in a while. I know. It's been what? A good year and a half, huh? Yeah. At I least. guess it has probably been that long. Okay, cool. Hey, uh, so I'm go ahead. I'm traveling and I'm staying at a friend's house. That's why I'm just stuck in this little corner here without a very nice backdrop. So but it should uh, work. That's all right. I don't have a good backdrop myself. Just my backyard. Um, patio yeah so um let's jump into it man um i haven't seen you for a while but um and i've seen some of your videos about the simulation and your youtube channel Simu simulation savant right correct yeah i try to get people to join subscribe to your channel is yes, that the only place you can't you're do on? this alone what's that is that the only place you're on facebook maybe or i have a um I have a travel channel called What a Country, W-U-T-A Country, okay. that I just play with a little bit. I'm not very serious about that one, but I try to just uh, kind of share this journey, what people call slow travel, okay. and um, do videos of places we've visited and that sort of thing. So it's kind of just fun. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll get that link from you and put it in the description. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I have a um, a fair amount of subscribers, and they're growing slowly. Uh, Good. Yeah, so some are toxic, and some are not. You know, right. I mean, that's just YouTube, you know? I it's don't know. YouTube. If, yeah, the ones who are silent are probably the non-toxic ones, you know? But, right. Uh, so it's slowly yeah. growing, and as you know, my channel is really centered around Islam, which you know right. about me and all, but... So, yeah, let, let's go ahead and jump into it. But first, uh, introduce yourself, your background, and why you got to this spot with the simulation, because this is new to me. I know nothing about the simulation, and I saw your video pop up, and I was like, man, that's Mike. And this is a new Mike <laughs> that I'm not aware of. Um, I do know you think outside the box, so it's not, it's not a surprise to me at all, but it is something yeah. new for you too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is new. This is about out, as out of the box as you get, right? Yeah. Um, well, quick background on me. I'm a lawyer. I was a professor for years. I ran a criminal justice program. Uh, I've always been interested in quantum physics, and I started only the second uh, neuroscience in the law class in the nation, which is looking at changes in uh, brain understanding, changes in quantum physics, changes in consciousness theory, and how that affects the law. And that's actually a huge area now. These classes are virtually at every college. Um, and there's hundreds of articles written on this every year. So, And then on my personal side, I had a personal journey, a very odd one for someone with my background, is I became an energy healer and I got involved in uh, past life regression and so journeyed into the new age area, the woo-woo area. I did weekly lectures on meditations and all those sorts of things for probably 15 years. And so I've always been interested in the odd, as you said. Uh, I, I love the alien questions. Um, and so uh, several years ago, the simulation hypothesis popped up. And there's a philosopher out of Oxford who kind of started it on uh, Neil Bolstrom. And uh, he's been on Rogan and a variety of, of, of uh, social media spots. And so he kind of posed the philosophical question that got everybody thinking. And this was quite some time ago. This was, uh, I want to say 2006, but it could be 2004. Uh, but then a lot of scientists started looking at this very closely because in this same period, we began to gather a lot of data, primarily out of the double slit experiment and the experiments that confirm that the observer actually alters physical reality. And so the notion that there has to be an observer 
in order for reality to be created is actually not a wild idea at all. It's actually mainstream quantum physics. And out of that, a whole bunch of people, including high profile people like Elon Musk, uh, you know, posed the argument that if you have to have an observer, then you got to have a creator. And and then also you it flows from the notion that if we can be this technically advanced right now, surely another another civilization could be this technically advanced or more easily. And so the the argument goes along. Uh, to the point where Musk kind of publicly said, it's a billion to one that we're in base reality. In other words, it's a billion to one that we're not in a simulation. Um, because of the science, because of technical advances in virtual reality, because of consciousness theory, uh, it's clear that we have no free will. Um it's clear from the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics, which was awarded to three researchers who concluded there is no local reality. In other words, this reality that you and I are functioning in is a function of our observation and our participation and creation of it. And when you stop looking at this world that you and I are functioning in right now, it disappears. Now, that sounds crazy, but that's the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. This is established, and it's so crazy as to be mind-boggling. So I consider myself to be a very multidisciplinary person, right? So, I mean, I read religion, philosophy, quantum physics, consciousness theory, history, on and on and on. And so I started putting all this together. And there's only a few people who have really written uh, kind of comprehensively about this. David Icke is one of them. Um, he's really controversial. Um, and and uh, he doesn't get as much credit as he should because he's so radical. I'm not so sure that his argument is all that radical. Uh, but he thinks uh, not only that we're in a simulation, and his book is called The Dream, really very, very good. Um, but he strays over into the political side. So I stay on the scientific and religious and spiritual side. He goes to the political side. So he's convinced not only that we're in a simulation, but that we're also uh, at war with an alien intelligence, uh, a reptilian race, excuse me, that lives on Earth and really runs things. So think of it as the juice behind the Illuminati or the juice behind the banking uh, elites or whatever have you, right? If you want to go down conspiracy theory holes. And so he argues there's a small cadre of people running things and they have the power and the support of a very sophisticated alien intelligence, which not only is on the earth, but to running things and it runs the, the, the matrix. Um, Again, wild stuff, right? I have, I'm not terribly interested in straying over into the political side. I'm more interested in exploring, okay, if we're in a simulation, and I've become convinced we are, if we're in it, what do we do with that? You know, how do we live? How do we find meaning? How do we function? Uh, how the hell did this thing get set up? And so... Uh, another very, very fascinating book on this is called Reality Plus, Plus Sign, uh, by David Chalmers. He's a leading philosopher out of NYU, and he really makes a very strong case for the simulation. But it's written as a professional philosopher, so it's hard to get through every question imaginable he addresses. But his central point is very valid, and that is we cannot prove we aren't in a simulation. So we have to take it seriously. And so I took that premise and began to think of it in terms of all the wild things that I've studied. Religions, um, consciousness theory, uh, near-death experiences, um, channeling, uh, the alien question, and so I brought all that into the existing debate, which has been primarily scientific. 
there's a guy, uh, Rizwan Verk, who's written a book called The Simulation Hypothesis. That's quite good. But after that, there's just not much out there on this topic. And so I set out on my channel to kind of synthesize a unique view of all this and a unique argument. And I'm convinced that there's actually three levels to the simulation. And I, I'm not aware of anybody making that argument. And I'm convinced that there are things that we can do here uh, to uh, better uh, our life, our functioning here. Um, I, I recently posted a video with some of those tips, and I'm going to try to develop that at greater length. But uh, that's probably a pretty good summary of how the heck I got here. And, and I can tell you it's a rough road uh, to get to the simulation hypothesis because it requires you throwing out almost everything you believe today. And I don't just mean your religious beliefs. I mean your cultural beliefs. I mean your fundamental beliefs about daily reality, uh, your, your beliefs about meaning. Uh, it all has to go because clearly the simulation has never been revealed to us from any source. And so we're kind of making it up as we go. And the problem is, if it's all programming, yikes, what does that say about what we've tried to create in terms of meaning and structure and culture on Earth? And so you're going to go through what I call the, the five stages of grief. You know, it's, it's a well-known psychological understanding, um, but it can be very, very troubling to get to this point. The other problem, <laughs> and you could probably tell just from the intro, is this will piss everybody off. So religious people don't want to hear that their God's not the creator of this sim and not it's not the right understanding of the sim, right? In fact, there's no religion that's revealed the sim to us, per se. Um, the New Agers are going to be pissed at me because the, the argument is this is all programming, uh, there's not meaning here. This this life is not animated by love. The, the simulation hypothesis can't find any place where love seems to be running the world. And all I think you have to do is watch the daily news to understand that God has either checked out or never checked in. And then, of course, um, you're going to piss off the atheists because the simulation hypothesis is probably the single strongest argument for a creator that's ever been raised. Um, and so everybody, and then people who are just trying to survive and live their everyday life, and, and they, if they find out about this or investigate it, then they, they realize that, you know, that there may be just a minion, uh, and that's going to piss you off, right? So starting a channel like this, means that I make every constituency out there angry. Um, not on purpose, <laughs> just trying to share my own investigation. Uh, but but these are strange spots to end up, right? Because um, once I think you buy into the simulation, and, and at least this is true for me, you will begin to see everything differently. Now, one last quick thing. The, the only person that I think has gotten close to giving us an idea of how this works is Guy Steven Needler. He has channeled God. I know that sounds nuts. He's been doing this for a long time. He's an engineer out of England. He's a very thorough, careful, calculated, rational guy. Uh, really tries hard to make sure that he's not downloading any of his own beliefs. And he has downloaded a, an explanation uh, of how all this was created and how all this works that is so scientifically detailed, I don't think he could have made it up. And it explains the simulation, even though when he's talking to God, God never says it's a simulation. Needler never uses the word simulation. But when I work through his works, he's got probably a dozen books or more. Um, I realized 
he was very in a very detailed way uh, describing uh, the simulation. And I think Donald Huffman, who is a, um, a professor at, at the University of California, he's also doing a, a very careful explanation of the simulation as well without knowing it. He doesn't call it a simulation. He simply argues that evolution has gotten us to the point where we only see what we need to see to live. So think of it as the word icon on your computer. You click on that and you load Word. All you needed to see was the icon. You didn't need to see the X's and O's and the ones and zeros and um, uh, the, 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 the data and the programming and the electronics and the chip and blah, blah, blah. And in fact, if you saw that, that would be so complicated and detailed that you wouldn't see the icon and wouldn't be able to click on it and use it. So he argues that's what physical reality is, it's literally a very ultra simple icon that allows us to function uh, in this reality. Um, and he's been making this argument long before the 2022 Nobel Prize was awarded, but he was promoting that work of these scientists who showed that the reality is actually created by the observer. And so he's he's argued, and I've added him into this structure of understanding all this. He argues we have no clue of what's on the other side of the icon, but it's not real. And this isn't real. And so these are really provocative, you know, intelligent, interesting people making these arguments. Throw in the fact that we have no theory of consciousness. There's no theory that explains how you and I wake up in the morning and have beliefs and fears and joys and personality. Uh, there's no explanation of love, of poetry. Um, the, the best arguments out there that one of the leading studies says it all flows out of an unconscious operating system. And so there's been a great deal of research that I used in my classes, because one of the fundamental uh, aspects of the criminal law is that we punish you because you have free will and because you chose to do bad. And that's why we don't punish you as bad if you're on drugs or if you're mentally ill, because you're not really choosing at that point. But if the science says we don't have free will and we don't make our own intentions, then why the hell are we executing people in the... Uh, in the, uh, you know, the gas chamber or whatever. And so there's a huge body of law on that. And I've written extensively in that area and I've lectured to legal groups all over the country on this. It's really interesting. Um, but if you take that, the idea that we don't have free will and that we have no explanation on how consciousness occurs, we can measure it, right? The brain seems to light up. If we had a, a measurement, uh, you know, a brain scan on your or my head right now, uh, we'd see activity, but but the problem is how does neurotransmitters and hormones and electricity generate words and thought and love and feeling and personality and memory? And we have no clue. Don't believe anybody. You'll see in the popular press, there's a there's hundred different theories on consciousness. And you'll see them in the popular press and you'll see people make arguments. The bottom line is we have zero clue. And that, to me, feeds into the simulation. Because we obviously are not just biological creatures. We, we have to have been placed in a game. A game that, as a character, the programming allows us to function in. It's called life here, but it may just be a cruel, you know, little game from a really immature, nasty little creator who just sits around and just watches all this and has a ball. And, and that's where Needler fits in, because when he talks to God directly, God says, the only reason I put all this in motion was for experience. I simply wanted to have more little bits of sentience, because God reveals himself to be nothing but mind. He's not even energy. 
mind, consciousness, sentience. And he combines with the energy that already existed in the world when he awoke. That's why I don't think Needler's talking to God. I think he's talking to the creator of this simulation. But I believe there's another level to the simulation on the other side of that that no one's ever reached. But this quote-unquote God says that when I awoke and I attempted to figure everything out, the universe was too vast, even for infinite mind. And so I've created little sparks of sentience, called them human beings, dropped them into a variety of environments. And there are 12. The Earth and, and these galaxies and the universe is just one of them. And this is the one where there's physicality. Most of the others are energetic. But the goal was to simply tap into our connection to that infinite mind. And, and he gets every single thought, experience, feeling, etc., all downloaded into this massive mind. Sounds an awful like a lot like a mainframe, right? Or, or a host or a cloud computer. Uh, and, and that's part of the problem here. All the computer lingo and the virtual reality lingo and the gaming lingo and the programming lingo all fits perfectly with the simulation. And so there in a nutshell, I think you have, have the simulation argument and it, it blows up everything. I hope you're blown up now. Yeah. Yeah. I know I followed, I seen some of your videos. I, so I have a, a few questions. Sure. Um, this is a layman's question. So there is a creator. No, yeah, I some mean, sort, not a creator like God, but there is a creator of the simulation. There, there seems to have to be, right? Logically, uh, because uh, games aren't created by accident. Uh, we have no instance of a video game that evolved by accident overnight while somebody left their computer on. Um, so, so it appears that this has to have been made and structured. And then the fact that we fit in it so perfectly suggests that we are actually designed and programmed as characters that can function in this environment. In fact, we function so well that it appears to be real. Right. So are we real? Yeah. Now, now that's, that's virtually 50% of David Chalmers' book, right? And he makes the argument, and I think he's in the minority, but he makes the argument that virtual realities can be just as real as biological ones or other ones, whatever they are, right? If, if we're in a video game, we have no clue what's outside of us. So this is all speculation. But he argues that this is real, that, that virtual realities and virtual characters are real, that we really feel things, we really experience things, that things really matter. But he's in the minority. Most of the scientists, uh, I think, who argue for the sim uh, basically believe it's just a video game and, and an artificial reality. Uh, but Chalmers really works hard to argue that virtual realities are real. I don't know that he accomplishes that, but he tries hard. And of course, he's a brilliant guy. So, um, so Charlie, for example, me, I yes. will I will cut off like a game and no longer exist when I pass. Is that how right. it works? Yes, maybe. See, I think there's actually three levels. So when you pass, you go to the level that, that I call the game. So that's the level which uh, historically religions and spiritual people have called heaven. Now, that's the place where we only have a spiritual existence, right? This is the level of soul and eternal soul. And this is the place where we then are recycled back to whatever reality we're going to. For you and me, it's Earth. And that reincarnation loop is how the game here, the matrix, I call the game on Earth the matrix. And then I call heaven the game. The game populates the matrix with characters. Not all of us that come here are fully sentient. Not all of us have a soul. 
there's a variety of names for this. The, the, the gaming world and, and the artificial intelligence world would call it um, non-player characters. So these are just people going through life, kind of clueless, just follow, just do what they're told, run completely on subconscious programming. So, the, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, the, the others uh, will call it backfill people. So some of the spiritual groups, Needler, his information calls it backfill people. And these, these are people who don't have full sentience, don't have a full soul, won't uh, reincarnate very often, but they kind of make the game work, right? If you've played a video game, there's going to be scenes and people and things happening in the game as you're trotting along that don't have anything to do with you, including beautiful scenery, what have you, right? That's the backdrop programming. And, but then the actual events occur with the character, with the player. And, and so my belief, and, and, and this is not in a majority, but my belief is that we're on a reincarnation loop and that we're tricked into coming back here by being told that it's for soul growth, it's being told for soul evolution, it's for our own good, we have more lessons to learn, our soul needs to evolve before it can finally ascend and never have to come back. Right. That would be nirvana and the Buddhist understanding. And so I think that we're duped at that level. And I think one of the hacks of dealing with this sim is to be so aware at the moment of death that when you pass over, don't get excited about the bright lights. Don't get excited about seeing God or family and friends who've passed realize that this is another sim and they're going to try to convince you to come back to continue to be in service of this simulation if we believe needler's work it's simply designed for experience there's no right and wrong no good or bad just be just do and so i think at that moment the key is to say i'm not going back so so charlie doesn't die but Charlie physically, Charlie character of the video game does die, but your sentience, your your essence um, continues on. Okay, so are, is the simulation pre-programmed or is there or are there many gods? Like uh, there's a creator playing you, there's a creator playing me, sort of like Fortnite, you know, everybody has their own creator. I mean, their own character, and they play the game. Is that how it works? Like, there's multiple gods playing well, each part, character? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem here is we have to really be clear. This is total speculation. The entire simulation argument is total speculation. The problem is it explains a whole bunch of things that nothing else does. And so when I give you this answer, it's total speculation. But uh, God, when he talks to Needler, said that he created 12 sub-gods. And they've created 12 other massive universes of experience. We only have one God. That's called Source Entity One. And he created Earth and, and the galaxies and this universe and did it in, in the third dimension where there's physicality. So did he program this or is he playing it right now? You know, don't know because that and we're not really told. What we're told is that we come here and that we, we get to experience these things and that our little bit of sentience is directly connected to the sentience of the original creator, Origin, if you follow Needler. And so there's one mind, one creator, and we all feed into that. Now, whether or not this is programmed, I mean, if we don't have free will, doesn't it have to be programmed? I mean, that's, that's the spooky part of the sim. And so you begin to pick up, you know, famous religious arguments like predestination, um, 
and uh, the, the notion that everything's already happened and you're just living it out. Um, and so there's no, no good answer to that. My argument is, is that Needler is only talking to the creator of this simulation. I don't believe Origin is the creator of the overall simulation. And we have no idea. That's never been revealed to us by any prophet, any scientist, any channel. We've never gotten past this God and this sim, if it is. And so total, total speculation. Maybe somebody will get to that other side. But when Needler's talking to God, Origin says he simply woke up. He became aware, but he was already formed. He was already sentient when he woke. He was already interacting with event space, which they call a space-time, kind of the equivalent of Einstein's space-time is event space. And, and energy already existed. And some of those energies had very low levels of consciousness. And so that tells me that origin was created and woke up in a pre-programmed sin. And so that's where my argument that we're actually in three different levels here. And that's another reason why it's so hard to figure it out. So three different levels. This The uh, earth level is called what again? I, I call it the matrix. But again, this yeah. is just my terminology. No, I understand. And then um, the game, once you die. The game is at heaven level. And then what's... Beyond that, and then that would be uh, origin. Origin. Hang on, my phone's ringing. That would so just be origin, origin the, level, the original creator. So is that capital R reality? Is that really where everything exists ultimately? Yeah, I mean that's the only place that we have anything other than uh, speculation. Needler could be a drug addict <laughs> and hallucinating. And simply wanting attention and writing phony books, I don't think so. I've I I I have devoted a great deal of time uh, to understanding him and his arguments, but he could be crazy, and he could be sharing something that just doesn't exist. And if you take Needler away, we've got damn near nothing. We have some near death experiences, but they're typically interacting at the level of what I call the planning room where they talk to you about what your goal he here is in coming back, uh, interaction with uh, family members, uh, learning, evolving your soul, you know, doing all the different things that we've been told so special, you know, about us on the spiritual new age side, you know, love animates the universe. And, and, but if we take away Needler, we have zero. So Needler could be total speculation. I've been drawn to Needler's work because we got nothing else. So what I'm trying to understand, because I have to relate it to my belief system. Right. And and try to unravel that, escape that for uh, a second to understand it. So when I die, I go to the game. And then I exist as Charlie, but you were saying I don't. Like, would I be one of those people to tell somebody else who died to go back, you know, do, do, does an uh, individual exist there and so on? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I mean, near death experience suggests it does channeling right. pretty conclusively suggests that it does. Right. But you wouldn't exist there at Eagle level. So you might remember that you were once Charlie, but you might remember that you were Dan and Barbara uh, and a whole bunch of other things, right? It's likely you've been here many, many times if we trust all the other information that we have. And so when you go back, you're not Charlie because that's something that's been formed here at ego level. So, you would go I, back I, I, to your essence. But I came from there. You came from there and you I chose thought, to be Charlie. So does anybody enter into the uh, origin, the third level? Or is that just where the gods exist? Not, not that we're aware of, right? Um, uh, Origin seems to be a soul player who's then created 12 sources. And then those 12 sources were empowered by Origin to create whatever they wanted, as long as it fed maximal experience back to the mind of Origin. 
this is very similar to science of God, right? I mean, and, and a lot of the uh, new thought movement, Christian movement in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, religious science, these folks all came to the conclusion that God was mind. And they did this really before uh, any sophisticated development of consciousness theory, because that came later after World War II. And they came up with the notion that God really, in essence, is mind and that we are all participating at the level of mind. And, right. and that seems to be probably the best vision of how all this works that I've been able to find. Okay, so we, we have about five more minutes. I don't want to get cut off while, while you're in the middle of talking. Um, so there's 11 other simulations going on Correct. at the same time right now. Correct. Um, are those in this uh, galaxy, or is that are they in different dimensions, or where are they at? So they are one hundred percent separate, according to what Needler has told us. Now, in Needler's books, he's been able to go and talk to each one of those cats and get some sense of what those realities look like. The reality that you and I are in is this huge, multiple galaxies universe that appears to be infinite, that's, that has multiple dimensions, has multiple parallel realities. And, and that one, uh, it, we actually, you, there can be up to 144 Charlies at any given moment in these various dimensions, and frequency levels of this source one environment. And so we would call that the sim. This is the, the, the larger sim, right, that we're involved in if this is all accurate. And so you are able to create 144 U's who are, and, and by the way, many worlds theory and parallel universes makes this argument now with a straight face in quantum physics. These aren't crazy theories. Many worlds theory is an accepted theory. And that's the notion that with every observation, there is a split off reality that creates a new existence. Now, what Needler's telling us is that only goes up to 144 people. Um, and so there may be many, many more event spaces to populate that, but there could be right now 144 Charlies. And they're experiencing everything at its, this exact same time. There is no time. Right. Sounds sort of like quantum physics and so on and so forth. A absolutely. It confirms uh, quantum physics to a T. Yeah. Um, I have two, uh, one question and then you can finish it off so we don't run out of time and just clicks off. Um, has this given you some sort of peace? And then... Um, just do some close closing and then call it. No, uh, no, no peace in the sim. I'm I'm getting ready to do a video soon on how do you find meaning here. And I think so. It's you very, have very no difficult. peace from uh, learning this, and no, because if this is true, the world is much worse than we ever imagined. At least before we could cling to our own religious notions at least before we could cling to the new age notion that love animates the universe. Many religions teach that love animates the universe. It's just that there's no evidence for that. Uh, but at least we had that belief. At least we had this idea that there were some folks on the other side, call it angels, God, uh, guardian angels, whatever lingo you want. But we had the notion that we had help. And, it, it, and in the sim, it appears that that we are a plaything, and that's pretty disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you choose to believe this? <laughs> Why didn't? You? All right. So we left off with me being a little sarcastic. I apologize. <laughs> I would, you know, why do you believe this if it doesn't give you peace? Yeah, because uh, I guess probably on lifelong training as a lawyer, right? You follow the evidence. And uh, rarely in the practice of law do you like where your evidence takes you, regardless of what side you're on, because life is complicated. But uh, no, I didn't choose this. Um, 
And it, it just began as I began, I became fascinated with the argument. I think probably my first introduction to it was in an interview that Musk did years ago. And I thought, oh, come on, this is wild. So I wanted to investigate it. And so over time, I've studied different things. There's some very good, uh, fancy, uh, professionally done YouTube videos uh, arguing for the simulation, but they're they're pretty um, uh, simple, you know what I mean? Not very detailed. And then they offer you nothing about what it means to be in the simulation or how we might live. And so when I... After a great deal of study and work, I realized that the simulation brought everything that I had studied together and explained it. And I didn't like it. I don't like it now. I, I, there, there's no peace in this simulation, uh, especially if you go the step that David Icke has gone uh, to argue that at the matrix level, this is a very anti-human simulation that uh, we're mistreated. So to look at poverty, illness, look at aging. Uh, if this is a simulation, why would anybody need to age? If this is a simulation, why would anybody need to suffer? Why would anybody need to get sick? Why would there be war, death, rape, violence, on and on and on? And if so, if this simulation has been created on purpose, and it seems it has, and, it, and if its purpose is just experience, then it looks like we're doing a pretty good job of it here. But it's not nice. It's not kind. It's not loving. I mean, I mean, look around the world right now. And, uh, you know, I'm older than you. And, and uh, you know, so I've seen <laughs> it's just progressively gotten worse on every level. Uh, I often tell people that I have discussions with, you know, friends and family, that there's not one aspect, for instance, of American society that I think is without corruption. There's not one aspect that I think functions without a real deep, selfish profit motive or some motive for power. And we can we can throw everything out there, medicine, academia business we've known about for a long time, right? Uh, but add everything else in, media. Uh, and, and so the, the pandemic really sharpened my focus on how an incredibly corrupt world society we live in. Um, and so if, if Ike's right, and this is a very anti-human place, and I keep trying to find evidence that he's wrong, and I can't. <laughs> well, let me ask you this when when did this begin it seems like a 70s 60s and then until now and then and then answer this question do you feel like you're going to add something to it expand on it because knowing you you're not going to buy everything they're saying and you're going to expand on it and you might become the next famous person within the simulation uh theory i don't know if it's a theory or what you would call it but just answer those two questions for me. Well, which means they'll probably kill me. <laughs> but um, probably. <laughs> well, um, uh, what was what was the first question? Uh, the history. You know, when yeah. it began, so when, when did the it idea start? really started. Yeah. So, so the notion, I think, has been in popular culture ever since computers were created. Right. So, you know how the sci fi and literary mind is really brilliant people. And, and frankly, I think they're channels or prophets in a sense. Right. They're gathering information that's not available to most of us. I mean, you look at what sci fi has gotten right over the last 50, 60 years, and it's dead on and often ahead of where the science actually is. And so, uh, in the pop culture, the notion of, of a artificial intelligence or simulations been bantied about. And one of the brilliant things about David Chalmers' book, Reality Plus, is that he gathers up every pop culture reference that he can find. So he has a brilliant history of where these kind of ideas began. It really became serious when Nick Bolstrom from Oxford posed a series, a, a logic question. 
you know, if A, then B, therefore C type uh, premise. And what, and what, so, what year is that? I want to say 2004 or 2006. I don't have it on the tip of my oh, head. So it's really, really new. Really new. You know, it reminds me of that uh, movie Tron. I don't know if you remember that movie. Yes. Tron. Yeah. So I don't know what year that was. Probably late 70s, maybe early 80s, probably. Yeah. But anyways, so you're saying it began with the computer age, basically. Yeah. Once we have computer analogies, programming, once gaming comes and you have characters think of of second life that the whole simulation program um and and so that's where it kind of entered the literary consciousness it it enters the scientific consciousness uh in the last 20 30 years or so when we really begin to understand that the observer is paramount and if there's no reality without the observer, then there has to be a first observer, and, or in Aristotle's sense, an unmoved mover. Is it in the academic world yet? Not that I'm aware of. Because I remember 30 years ago, uh, a philosophy class called Mind and Machine. So oh, it, yes. it was getting there, but probably not regarding the simulation. So the, the next question is, what do you think everyone so far has gotten wrong and where you are going to add to the theory? Charlie, these are really good questions. You're really impressing me. Yeah, my, <laughs> my last name is Charlie Rogan. <laughs> what has anybody gotten wrong? I think nothing uh, because none of us know. All right. Um, I think uh, what I add is a multidisciplinary approach. So Chalmers, he looks at this just from a professional philosophy standpoint. Uh, Ike has, has probably the most multidisciplinary view of it, but he doesn't touch channeling. He doesn't touch uh, A Course of Miracles, which I think has a lot of insight. Uh, are you familiar with A Course of Miracles at all? This is a believed to have been channeled from Jesus. Yes, from it, you, you, you. I was going to say you've taught me a lot about me. it, but you yeah. told me, yeah. And so there are millions of adherents to a course in miracles, millions around the world, and yet hardly anybody even knows about it. Believed to have been channeled from Jesus, and the central disturbing premise is that this is an illusion. Your Eastern religions have for thousands of years taught that this is an illusion. And so as I began to gather all these different pieces and parts, uh, so that's what I offer. I offer a very comprehensive look. I think all religions support the sim, all New Age teachings, channeling, near-death experiences, channel in or, or, or tunnel into the sim. And I think, obviously, the, the strongest arguments originally were scientific ones. And so once the programming lingo, uh, you know, enters into our daily lexicon, um, that's when the science piece, I think, really, really picks up. Um, but, but the observer effect, the lack of consciousness theory, and then all the other kind of anecdotal experiences, I think, from near-death experiences and channels and prophets, you pull all that in, and I think all of them all along have been talking about the simulation and either don't know it now or didn't know it then. So I have a question in regards to, you're saying there's one God, he created 12 separate gods. For our God, for lack of a better word, I guess the creator of our simulation, does that creator have a purpose for us? I know we don't have a personal purpose but does that creator have a purpose for us why is it creating this simulation and what's the goal what's the objective i don't understand this the only person that i believe has any legitimate information about that question is needler and he's told that the entire simulation was created simply for experience 
David Icke uses a word from some other esoteric sources. He calls it louche or emotion. And, and so, but they're basically saying the same thing. But, but origin empowers these 12 gods to create anything they want, provided it maximizes the amount of experience, emotion, thought back into the mind of origin. And so our sole purpose is to experience. And if Ike's right, um, the, the harsher our experience here, the more suffering, the more powerful that energetic message would be going back to the mind of God. And since there's no good and bad and there's no judgment, um, it's just maximal energy. And so our suffering seems to serve the sole purpose of providing um, secondhand experience to a creator who doesn't seem very loving, <laughs> right? I mean, I, and again, I'm not saying this is correct. I'm a pretty rational guy. I'm, I'm not on any meds right now. <laughs> and I've thought through all of this for years. Uh, but this is a very, very troubling conclusion to reach because there just doesn't seem to be any evidence um, that there's much purpose here. So it's for the the God, the original God, capital G. -Q. Right, right. Origin. So, yeah, so it's, so are the 12 gods a simulation or are they real? I, I think origin's a simulation. Uh, I think I think origin's been created, but clearly our simulation seems to begin with origin. He creates the twelve source gods, and so yes, in my opinion, this is all simulation. Now, they don't tell Needler that, and Needler doesn't call it that. That's my interpretation of the data. So the the originator of this was created. That's what I think. But how is that possible? Um, let's talk about God. How is that possible, right? It leads us back to the greatest question of all of life, right? And no one's ever answered it. And that's why we have, what, 100,000 religions on earth? I haven't seen the latest count. I know there's 50,000 different Christian sects. So there's got to be 100,000 different religions on the planet, all claiming to understand the the how and why of god right and part of the problem is they can't all be right and since there's so many i would argue logically they're all wrong and so this so-called loving god has never accurately and fully revealed themselves to us and i don't like that but i'm assuming the god of this simulation is creating all that for some reason right so right and that that's the that's the million dollar question right why no one has that answer other than this idea that we're all bits of the mind of god and our experiences thoughts feelings all funnel back to one central mind which is really the essence of reality all the rest is made up do you plan on writing about this? Maybe a book or because I know you're a writer. I, I don't do know. It. You know, I mean, that's a that's a great that's a great argument. Um, I haven't thought about that. I've, I've been trying to get some novels done. I finished one novel and I'm trying to get it published. So I'd rather do this in novel form. That might be kind of fun. Uh, I think you'd reach a lot more people. I don't think anybody is selling very many books on the simulation. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a pretty esoteric little corner. But really, the, the biggest piece, because this flows back to the question you asked a minute ago, the biggest piece I'm doing this is to try to share uh, some of what I've tried to figure out will help us exist in this mess. And, and by the way, my wife's 100% with me. This has been a wild adventure. To have your partner become crazy at the same time as you are is really fun. She's even more cynical than I am. It's had a really profound effect on her. But what we realized is that we, we didn't not just come out and tell people we're in a simulation and go, ha, 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 
uh, you know, because I, I don't, I'm not a graphics expert. I'm not a programmer. So I'm not doing fancy videos. You know, I've just got my head on a screen and, and hopefully I'm sharing something valuable. Now, there's people out there with beautiful graphics, you know, arguing for the simulation. But what I think we're doing that's different is we're going to try to give you some tips to survive, uh, to to manage this. Yeah, well, that's your goal. latest video is about that. Yes. And so that's that's the start. My, my plan is to to take those. I think I had 12. I'm sure there's 100 more. But take those 12 and do entire videos on each one of them to really give people some, some hope. Right. But again, we're, we're still speculating. We're still trying to function within this game when we have no idea what the game is, who created it or why. Yeah. You know, you have me thinking, uh, one, you can't call it the game because that's the next life. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you have me <laughs> thinking is the, God of this simulation playing me as a Muslim and playing my neighbor as a Christian. And I understand it's not real, but what's the problem with that? There's not a problem with that, is it, in regards to this theory? Well, if if experience is the goal and everything else is okay, then you can go out and kill somebody today and, and have no problem in the afterlife. Um, and so in other words, there's no right and wrong here. There's no good and bad. There's simply experience. And the stronger the experience, the more powerful the energetic message back to the mind of God. Now, now Ike's argument, and I believe more and more that he's on to something, is that at the matrix level, the conflict between us at the level of religion and money and culture, and country, blah, blah, blah. The conflict at that level is manipulated on purpose. And this is designed by people who don't much like humans. He argues it's a reptilian race. And that sounds so crazy that he's kind of been banished. He, he doesn't have the attention that I think he deserves. But certainly the notion that there's a sophisticated alien race in her interacting with us is not a stretch at all. We have to get our hands around this alien issue and quit being children about it. Um, and I'm convinced that it's the Anunnaki who have, it's the record of the first alien intervention on earth. And the Sumerians and Babylonians and Assyrians recorded all these interactions with this alien race on stone tablets. You can go read them today in the British Museum or the Baghdad Museum. And because they were created on stone, they, they didn't deteriorate. And, and, and we have hundreds of thousands of stone tablets. And the Sumerians clearly say, folks came from the heavens. That's really what the word Anunnaki means. Folks from above came down and shared all their knowledge with them and then began to run the earth. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but the problem is we have stone tablets laying it out. The other thing that argues, now, of course, we have religious records of all kinds of crazy things. Why take the Sumerians serious? Very simple. They're the first city, the first uh, law, the first language that we have, the first writing, the first government, the first um, uh, indoor plumbing. I can go on and on and on. There's some famous books that have been written about how literally every human first in recorded history starts in Sumeria. And oh, wow. in those tablets, they say, we didn't make this up. I mean, if you're really egotistical, wouldn't you love to write a tablet that said, I invented indoor plumbing? <laughs> right. So you, right? You have, Look, yeah, you have me uh, now. Now I'm confused. So this is another theory, though, you're talking about. This is not the same theory of the 12th. Well, but what I'm arguing is that that's the beginning of this external alien race manipulating us at the level of the matrix. Because right. it's only then that we get war. It's only then that we have any record of patriarchy. 
it's only then that we have any record of execution and prisons. This all shows up at once six, 7,000 years ago. And there's no other record in on earth anywhere of war, of, of cities, of any of the things that we subscribe to ordinary life. And so the argument is, is that this anti-human group that's running things at the level of the matrix has been here since the Anunnaki days. So I don't think it's a stretch. We have stone tablets recording it. So in regards to uh, uh, ancient prophets, is Moses, Jesus, even Prophet Muhammad, uh, are they tapped into this in this theory in some in some sense uh, or a better way than you and I like not channeling, but the God is playing them as a special role in people's lives? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I would argue and I know this will be controversial and you'll get hate mail here, but uh, I would argue that all of these great prophets were real. These weren't people just making things up, but but what they thought they were interacting with wasn't what they thought. And so I think uh, all of these prophets were interacting with very sophisticated alien intelligences and didn't know it. But, but, and now, they, so, but now you're – okay, you, you've confused me now. So they're not – you're saying they're channeling – aliens correct not channeling i think they're actually talking to them okay talking to them but so this is not in regards to the the god of this simulation anymore you're talking about something separate now correct no I, i'm talking about the bad guys that operate within the simulation and run the matrix oh so the aliens are part of the simulation they are correct they're not also, they're not the creators of it oh okay, okay. not I, not I the ones at matrix level now, now, Nick Bolstrom, the philosopher of Oxford, argues that it's likely we are a simulation from a very sophisticated uh, uh, alien civilization far in the future. But what I'm arguing for is here within this simulation, the folks that are running the matrix have been around a while and they've been mistaken as gods. So they're not. Um, so the prophets are not tapping into the god of this simulation. I don't think so. They're playing within the simulation itself, thinking they're and, tapping into and been the tricked. God. Yep. Oh, yeah, tricked. And on on purpose, right? These are not nice people, right? Yeah, I'll probably I probably just mean, lost about two hundred subscribers, but that's correct. Okay. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> that, I'll get some okay. death threats, but that's what I was saying earlier. No one will like this argument. Right. This makes no one happy. Now, now the way to get subscribers on YouTube is to come out with something everybody likes and they'll sign oh, up yeah, and they'll yeah, buy yeah. coffee mugs. Right. Yeah, no, no one's doubt. going to like this chat today, Charlie. No, it's a good thing. You need to talk about it. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's nothing wrong with talking about it. I mean, oh, I, I, agree. I feel like if 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 I believed in the simulation and, you know, I'm not there yet, but I'm being played by the God to be a Muslim. And I don't find anything wrong with that. And you were played, what, 40 years ago to be a Christian minister or whatever you were going into. But uh, but that's all to go back to the originator to have his or her or its experience. That's extremely interesting. Very selfish. Yeah, God. But, very but the, selfish. Oh, very. But again, I'm not sure we're actually talking to the creator of the sim at that level. I think we're talking to nefarious people that have penetrated our sim and are much more sophisticated than, than, we, than we are. And they've been manipulating us for thousands of years. Yeah, in some way, you could, in Islam, those would be jinn and so forth. Yes. So, yeah, in some way. I don't know how to connect it. I, I just thought about it. but Devil. Devil, demons, you know. Demons. Uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, I've been reading at some in the in the Old Testament here just the last couple of days uh, because I'm I'm looking at uh, uh, some of the antecedents of law. So the or some of the or, the earliest law we have is is uh, from Sumeria, from 
uh, uh, the Assyrians in that area, the Hammurabi Code and some other codes from that area era. And they are, these early laws are so nasty. And, and the God of the Old Testament is so nasty, kills so many people, uh, has, you know, specifically recommends punishments that we would think today are sick. And, and uh, the Gnostics, the earliest Christians after Jesus' death, uh, the Gnostics concluded that that could not be, the God of the Old Testament could not be the God that sent Jesus. So the Gnostics came up with a dual God apparatus, and the bad guys, the Demiurge. And so they argued that Yahweh, or the God of the Old Testament, uh, was a fake God and hated humanity. And the first Bible was created by the Gnostics, and they had none of the Old Testament in it. Now, those guys were all wiped out. And once the Orthodox Christians obtained the approval of Rome and became the religion of Rome in the fourth century, uh, the Gnostics were outlawed, killed, their churches were burned, all their books were burned. Uh, and as were all pagan religions. And a lot, a lot of people don't, don't know the history of this, but it's awful. Um, and, and so we lost all this, this information and this history of early Christianity. Luckily, some monks uh, hid many of the Gnostic Gospels in some uh, jars, clay jars, and we found them in, the, in Egypt in the 1940s. And so we have a lot of those documents that the Gnostics argued were just as revealed uh, as the books that are now in the New Testament. But when, when uh, Constantine became Christian, uh, he said Rome is too great not to have a Bible, and so he commissioned the first Bible, and those guys who put it together specifically X'd out all of the Gnostic writings. So we had the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, uh, the Gospel of Truth, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, on and on and on. All those were X'd out, even though those were common writings and teachings in the Christian community. So you got a very skewed, uh, uh, you know, final version of Christianity. And the reason it became the final version is anything else was outlawed. In fact, Theodosius Ish, the the, the uh, uh, emperor of Rome in the late 300s issued an edict demanding that all of these documents and churches be destroyed and anybody found uh, with a Gnostic or pagan document would be deemed mentally ill and executed. So that's the early history, right? And so the, the history of most religions, unfortunately, is so bound up with censorship and violence uh, exclusion of anybody else's understanding, the notion I'm the only right prophet, right? And I think this has all been on purpose to create maximal uh, violence, disagreement, division among humans, because that increases the amount of experience and the intensity of the emotions. So, so how do you survive that? I mean, how do you get past that? I mean, you you're telling me but it's what the world is today right yeah i don't know how you get past it right i mean there are ways of minimizing it i think the the first thing you can do is to stop making all this so real right it's a little bit of the buddhist notion of the way of living uh to not be attached to this world jesus kind of alludes to it when he says be of this world but not in this world Right. So and the Course in Miracles talks about how this is all made up and it's a projection of your mind from your ego. And so stop imagining it's true. We still have to live here. We still have to function. This is not an argument to go out and kill yourself and end it all. But quit imagining that what you think is true and what you believe is true really is. Right. I think that's the greatest mistake of all religious people. Religions serve great needs and, and are extremely valuable. They become dangerous the moment in which we believe they're true. In other words, they're not just good enough for me and my soul, but they're so true that now I'm allowed to kill you because you don't agree with me, right? That's the moment at which we're no longer 
a, in a religion. We're now in a, a power uh, angle that that is completely separate from any notion of love or neighbor or what have you. And so, but I think that's the first thing is to quit waking up and taking all this so seriously and imagining that every bad event, every bad thing that's happening to you is real. Um, that's not easy to do, right? That's not talk. That takes great devotion. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can relate it to is meditation. You right. Know? But uh, right. I was, I was going to ask you, let's move to the, the, the concept of love because way earlier you mentioned love doesn't exist. It's not real. Yeah. So but, if we're in a simulation, I mean, cause you definitely feel it. Correct. Sure. But but that's that's uh, ego, that's subconscious, that's sensibility, that's emotion. The notion that love animates the world is what I'm talking about. Obviously, there's love between us and family and loved ones, et cetera. But the notion that love animates the universe, you know, Islam teaches this, Christianity teaches this, the New Agers teach this. I find no evidence for it. In other words, if this is a sim and we're playing out the game, uh, then then a lover would not have created it this way. I would not be getting old, and I don't like that, by the way. And and I would not be getting sick, or I would not need surgery or illness or drugs. or uh, I mean, there would be no war. There wouldn't be poverty. There wouldn't be hate. There wouldn't be violence, on and on and on. If you created a sin around love, it would look a lot different than this. Yeah, but you're saying it's on purpose in order for the originator to have its experience. Correct. Because if it's all love, I mean, I mean that's a good experience, but war. Well, he likes love, more. I'm sure, right? Yeah, but, but, how, but powerful when you hate, honestly. Correct. Feels like it. Correct. I mean, I mean, people don't get excited about politicians because they love them. They get excited about politicians because they hate the other one. And, and same with patriotism or nationalism or, or being uh, around your own religion or tribe or culture, right? I mean, the history of humanity after the Anunnaki show up and we get our first cities, our first developed uh, civilizations, the history after that is non-stop war, non-stop. And really? I'm talking not war like we do it now. War like we do it now is horrific. It's nothing like what the Romans did, the Greeks did. They came in and man, woman, and child was killed. And the place was burned to the ground. And and it it I mean I mean uh, and we're talking about horrific torture uh, for fun. And often these tortures were, were set down by kings and queens as law. Uh, um, uh, Braveheart, you remember that movie? Uh, he was drawn and quartered and then dragged through the street so he could be beaten. And then he was, then he had his head chopped off and he was put on a pole outside of the of parliament or something. No, it was the, the, the London Bridge. Uh, that was what was written down as the law. That was the punishment. It wasn't that these folks kind of lost control, broke into the jail and lynched him and then felt bad the next day. They were all drunk. No, this was the punishment that sane, rational, calm people chose, right? And they loved to watch it. We loved to watch the torture and the blood and the Colosseum. Yeah, it's the, sort of like that right now with what's going on in the world. It a hundred percent. I mean, you turn on the news, CNN, Fox, people love to watch it. Oh but yeah. I, but I have a question in regards to the originator, the original God. You explained it, but I don't know if I grasped it. Um, what is its reasoning for it to have the experiences that we are experiencing? Like what is, why? I don't understand. Yeah. I mean, all we have is what Needler was able to ask and get. Needler may be wrong. Um, we may have no information, but this this is the only info we have from someone 
who's claiming to be the originator of this. And it looks like it really is, right? I mean, a lot of people would say, well, my God, my religion teaches me the origin of the universe and teaches me what this is all for. The problem is there's no evidence for that, and it doesn't seem to fit our reality, which is why they call it faith, all right? So, so what is your your take on why? Because well, the, the originator it, it, is not even real itself based on your understanding. Yeah, maybe not. Right. I mean, uh, it may be that there's folks pulling the strings even behind origin. But what origin tells Needler is that he woke up and he began to investigate infinity and realized after billions of years, he was never going to figure it out, never going to be able to reach it. It's that big which sounds an awful lot like a simulation to me, right? The video game never ends. There's just another panel of programming pops up, right? And what are we seeing in the James Webb telescope, right? The further out we get, we go, oops, oh, look, there's a whole other screen of reality and galaxies. It looks an awful lot like there's a video game feeding this reality into it. But going back to, to uh, Origin, Origin says, I can't figure it out on my own. And so I'm going to create 12 sub-origins. He calls them source entities. And then their goal was to take little bits of their sentience, create us, send us into whatever experience it is. And since we're directly wired through source and source is directly wired back to origin, what we're actively doing is interacting at the level of mind which, by the way, is what Course in Miracles says, all that exists. So experience that, is real. Experience it, is real. Experience is real at the level of mind. At mind. Not at physical level. Right, right. But mind exists here in the matrix. It looks like it, right? It feels but we like don't it. know. I mean, David Chalmers would argue that your, uh, what do you call it, avatar is real. Uh, but I don't see anybody else making that same argument. But if our experience is going back to the originator, then I don't know. That, that's the level of energy, okay? So we're connected at a level of mind. So imagine sentience can't be broken. And so you can take a little piece of it and give it to somebody else, and now I'm getting all of your emotion and all your thought. And so uh, that's what we're told. Again, um, I just believe it's the only source we have that even begins to resemble the simulation. Okay. So let's end it here, but don't hop off. I'm just going right. to click off um, the recording. Well, Charlie, thanks very much. This has been fun. Yeah, it has been. Um I don't know where the recording. How about I just click out, then I'll click back in. All right. And all right. So, all right. So, thank you, Mike. Dr. Very well. Davis. You you put your last name in there, so I just called you Dr. Davis. If that's okay. Hey, all right. Good man. I'll <laughs> click back in. All right. I'll wait. Okay. <laughs>